let us do it Hitchcock style. First earthquake and then the tension is rising. But let it rise slowly. First of all, when it comes to Tiso, his biography is very similar to the one of Hlinka. Born in a poor family, starts going to school, people realize he's smart, starts getting help. Then it's a Catholic high school, he, becomes, uh, he decides to become a priest, eventually graduates from theology um, in Vienna. Then, as a priest, he is sent to a number of places in Slovakia. Wherever he goes, he's famous for being very active against alcoholism, especially. But one thing that makes him different from Klinka, he did not, uh, he wasn't a Slovak fighter. He felt more like citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. For example, signing his name the Hungarian way. But then the country collapses, and in uh, the Czechoslovakia between the wars, he joins the Common uh, People's Party of Hlinka. He was a diplomat, really. People knew he could speak to different uh, types of people, to a professor and to a simple peasant. So he rises in the ranks, and by the 30s, people see him as the right hand of Hlinka. And it is so. When Hlinka died, it is Tiso who becomes the head of the party and introduces 6 October 38, the autonomy of Slovakia. And right off the bat also starts introducing fascism. Already in the 30s, like many others, he was turning to authoritarian systems, already claiming in 35, one nation, one party, one leader. But that leader was Hlinka back then. So another thing that happens right off the bat, the cult of Hlinka is introduced. Maybe the best symbol being a paramilitary force called Hlinkova Garda, Hlinka's Guard. But that is yet to come later, as first we need to deal with the first big diplomatic issue facing Tiso. First, let's have a look at Czechoslovakia between the wars. Only 70% of the country were actually Czechs and Slovaks. In Czechia, in the West, plenty of ethnic Germans, but focus on the south of Slovakia. There were plenty of ethnic Hungarians there. And when the Conference of Munich started and ended with victory for Germany claiming plenty of land in the West, Hungarians saw their moment. Vienna Award, 2nd November 38, Hungarians take 20% of Slovakia. For Tiso, it was a huge shock, but he learned very quickly. So when March 39 came, Hitler wants com complete control of the Czech lands. He, Tiso has to go to Berlin for talks and he is told either he declares Slovak independence or Slovakia is left to the Hungarians, who by the way did not wait. They started a war when the, when the talks were still on in eastern Slovakia in today's western Ukraine around a city called Ushhorod. So Tiso went back to Bratislava told his party how things stand and they decided. 14th of March 1939 Slovakia declares its independence and this is the so-called First Slovak Republic. Which to be honest was neither independent nor a republic. Let's start with the latter. First of all the Common People's Party of Hlinka, so the so-called Ludaci, they remain the only official party in the state. You have two kind of duches, so to speak. One is symbolic, it's Hlinka still, and of course another head of state, the practical one, Tiso. But maybe the most important symbols are two, are two organizations. Something like a Hitler Jugend, Hlinkova Mladež, but more still important, the Hlinka Guard, very similar to the famous SS of Nazi Germany. It did have its own predecessor. Already in the 20s, the party had a um, party militia, which, by the way, at the time was a common phenomenon in Europe. But eventually, it did become way more. It did become kind of an organization to shape a perfect Slovak. And all those things, especially the Hlinka Guard, are perfect examples that there was no actual republic. Slovakia was a fascist state. Alexander Mach was the head of um, the Hlinka Guard, which brings us to another very interesting thing. In the party, there were actually two wings. Tiso himself represented kind of a 100% fascist, more like Franco's Spain or Salazar's Portugal type of government. But Mach, and another maybe even more important, Wojciech Tuka, represented proper Nazism. They both wanted Slovakia to become a copy of the Third Reich. And in the end, the fight between the two wings was used uh, by Berlin. If Tiso wants to march independence, Tuka and Mach are always there to take his seat. 
Maybe the best symbol of the influence of Nazism in Slovakia is the way the Jews and the Roma were treated. But that's a story for another episode. Now, a moment ago I mentioned that Berlin was using the internal struggles in the party to their own benefit. Well, that shows you pretty much that Slovakia wasn't really independent. And it was played out not simply by the ambassador of Germany in Bratislava. Germany sent residents, both civil and military. And the best way to see that Slovakia wasn't an independent country, 1st September 1939, part of the Slovak army is under German command invading Poland from the south. So how about the general Slovak society? Well, the Ludaci, they already had many voters before the war, so I imagine those were loyal to the party and kept on voting. I imagine also many people thought uh, with all the democracies um, falling in Europe that maybe it is an authoritarian system which has a um, better future than a democracy. Plus, I believe that with all the insecurity around and all the um, threat of war, there were people who simply for the sake of security decided to go for it. Plus also what we have to say is that the Slovak um, economy was connected immediately to the German one, which again shows that Slovakia wasn't really independent, but actually at the beginning it did have uh, many positive sides, simply because at the very beginning the economy of Germany through militarization was going very well, so Slovak as well. Industrialization of Slovakia. Practically no unemployment, because you either work in the new industry or you go voluntarily, in case of Slovakia, to work in Germany. So there's plenty of money and um, there's education, new universities, schools, there's culture, theaters, plenty of things going on. So I imagine many, many people looking around them, they would say, well, maybe it's actually not the worst choice in the end. But this is not the first time that the society sells its long-term liberties for short-term security and economic growth. But turns out, plenty of people were still not convinced. Behind me, maybe it doesn't look like much, the typical 70s blocks and uh, the typical beautiful view of the mountains. But we are here for a very important reason for the locals. They are pride, I think I can say. We are going to visit museum of their national uprising of 1944. An uprising which was pretty much against Nazi Germany and their own government. So let's have a look at uh, what interesting things we are going to learn here. Well, we've learned quite a bit already. Most of the photos and videos that you've seen till now are from the museum. So here is the entrance and there's already something very interesting. Turns out that there was a machine gun owned by Germans which would in half a minute spit out 600 bullets. And those 600 bullets you'll see now in a wall. Why do they show us this? Today, half a minute, it's the time we need to take a selfie. So that was rather smart. But also, how about the uprising? How it started? Well, first of all, not everybody was happy about a uh, fascist state. There were actually people who were not happy that Slovakia even separated from Czechoslovakia. So in London there is a guy called Edward Benes and he is the head of the Czechoslovak government in exile. In Slovakia there were plenty of partisans, especially communists, plus in the east alongside Nazi Germany there was a Slovak army fighting officially against Soviet Union but in reality many people desert and join uh, Soviets, especially after the famous Battle of Stalingrad. So, in the end, 1943, there are plenty of people in Slovakia, from the center to communists, thinking about changing the regime. And in December 43, a Slovak National Council was established. They were supposed to prepare the uprising. They managed to contact one Jan Golian, who was officially an officer in the Slovak army, but also not very happy about the fascist Slovak state. So they got in touch and they started thinking about the uprising. So Golian himself was stationed in Banska Bystrica with some 10,000 people he was supposed to take center of Slovakia. But most of his army he sent to the east. There is a very important mountain pass, Dukla Pass, 
if you take it, then the Soviets can come and help the Slovak uprising. So that was the plan by June 44. Preparations begin, and in the meantime, August 44, two important things. Warsaw uprising started in Poland, and Romania joins the Allies. Tiso, in panic, introduces martial law, which obviously did not help. But then Germans think it's time to take everything into their own hands. And 28th of August begins the occupation of Slovakia by the German troops. Both the martial law and the German occupation were huge blows to the preparations of the uprising. Yet Golian decided to begin anyway. 8 p.m. 29th of August 44, he starts the uprising. And here from the very beginning things went downhill. Turns out in the east the officers ran to the Soviet army, leaving their soldiers abandoned. They had no idea what to do. In the end, the Eastern Army was arrested by Germans. So it is only in Banska Bystrica where those 10,000 people under Golian actually rose up. And they took very quickly the whole region uh, around the town. And here you see it. Very soon they mobilized all the men that were able to fight 60,000 people in total by late September 44. But not only locals, there were plenty of um, people from plenty of other countries, 10,000 uh, in the end extra to join the uprising. At the entrance they had those bricks with names of all the uh, nations. So now look um, carefully and closely, hopefully you are going to find your people here as well who helped the Slovaks in their national uprising to make you feel proud. Now it all looks fine and dandy and everything, but all those people were up against the German army. 48,000, so fewer, but better trained and better equipped than the uprising. So actually Golian thought the uprising will not last longer than two weeks. Let me tell you straight up, it actually lasted for two months. So longer than anybody expected, but of course here I'm not going to go into Los occidentales mandan aviones con algo de ayuda, pero todo era poco al final. En pomoc, ale to wszystko oczywiście było za mało. Tutaj już nie będę wchodził w szczegóły tego, jak dokładnie walki wyglądały, gdzie walczono, kto brał udział i w jakim wymiarze, no bo oczywiście od tego już jest muzeum jako takie. Natomiast jeden ciekawy szczegół, o którym warto wspomnieć, to kobiety. Pojawiały się bardzo często w wywiadach, na zdjęciach, w różnych rolach i trudno mi powiedzieć, czy to jest pomysł samego or were they really such a big part of the uprising, but let me show you here an example of a female soldier. Suddenly there were gunshots. I felt that I had been shot in the back. They thought that I was dead, but I had survived. I wasn't sure how it was possible that I survived. There was a hole in my backpack and my dress. They captured us and questioned us. They split us up. Soldiers, non-soldiers and Jews. They shot those two Jewish girls. They wanted to shoot the rest of us in the morning. They sent us to the hay and held us there. One German came to me and asked me to sleep with him. He said that they would shoot me in the morning anyway, so why not? I told him if they shoot us in the morning, so be it. I won't sleep with you. After the war, the captain who guided us through the mountains came to me. He brought me a can of sardines. It had the bullet that was supposed to kill me in it. Two more interesting details. One of them is that the Slovak National Council, the political head of the uprising, they did not consider themselves simply opposition to the regime of Tiso. They considered themselves continuation of pre-war Czechoslovakia. And as the uprising was rather to the left, then Tiso started using a word Czechobolshevism to discredit the uprising and the Hlinka guards were sent against them. Very soon it turns out that they are as brutal and sadistic as Nazi Germany and became with time one of the most important and hated symbols of the regime of Tiso. 
But also when it comes to Germans themselves, well, unfortunately, that's nothing new. Brutality, sadism, um, mass executions, many places burned down to the ground for helping the uprising. So eventually, Banska Bystrica, after two months of the uprising, after being bombarded, gave up um, end October 44. Now, Golian actually gave the orders to go into the woods and uh, mountains. So actually, the uprising did not really end. There were partisans fighting until beginning of 45. Now, Golian himself was found very quickly in a little village hiding. He was taken into the camp and eventually executed. And of course, the village itself got burned down to the ground. Today, two most important places of mass executions became important symbols. So one is called Nemetska, where there were limestone kilns, so the people killed could be burned um, instantly. Second is called Kremnichka. Now here, what you had was anti-tank ditches. So basically, um, holes in the ground, which is perfect, because what you do is tell the people to line down, you shoot them in, the ba in their backs, and then another level of people on top of them, and so on and so forth. So in the end, at least 900 people were killed in Nemetska, at least 700 were killed in Kremnichka. Of the two, we visited Kremnichka, as you can see. So here's the main monument, which is actually not simply a monument, it is also a cemetery, because many of the people who were after the war exhumed, you couldn't tell who they were, so there are a number of mass graves here. What was really impactful, there's a bus stop with the places and numbers of people that were found in the ditches. Now, how to sum it all up? I think there are a number of levels, one of them being social, as in, turns out many people were not content with uh, fascist Slovakia. Many people under the right circumstances were ready to fight. But also, maybe more importantly still, I guess there were many people who, you know, they feel all right and the economy is growing and security and so on. But when the uprising did begin and who used to be officially your friend, Germany is occupying you and killing people in horrible ways. And not only Germans, your own people, the Hlinka guards are not less brutal. My guess is many people who were maybe not 100% for the uprising understood one very simple thing that their security and their economic growth everybody else had to pay for it with their lives that's one thing another thing i guess more important still is the political issue and here a very smart thing that the uprising did and they considered themselves continuation of the pre-Munich Czechoslovakia. Not only the Slovak um, Council, but also the army. It wasn't the Slovak Uprising Army or something. They called themselves the first Czechoslovak army. So in a sense, what they did, they nullified the whole issue of uh, the so-called First Republic as if it never existed politically, which is extremely important because when the war was about to end, Slovakia was not on the losing side. Several years of them being friend of Germany, of fascist Slovakia, was nullified by the uprising. A very good example is the issue of southern Slovakia, which in November 38 was taken by Hungary. Hungary did not have an uprising against Germany. Slovakia did have an uprising. So after the war, what was claimed by Hungary in the Vienna Award was given back to Czechoslovakia. So that was the on, on the political level, even if, of course, there was death, there was bloodshed in Slovakia, they did win recognition as allies, not as friends of Nazi Germany. So even though they lost militarily, they most definitely won in terms of politics. And not only politics, another very important level is, of course, the let's call it moral level because consider this for a number of years the main people in Slovakia are the likes of Tiso, Tuka and Mach those were the heroes the people that are considered the most important are the Hlinka guards 
Fortunately, because the uprising did happen, suddenly Slovaks have hundreds and thousands of, let's call them, positive heroes, people fighting for freedom, people fighting against fascism, and um, till the very day you can see it in social space. Pretty much every Slovak town has something connected to the um, uprising. There's going to be a street or a square or whatnot um, named after it. So basically there are hundreds and thousands of, well, uprising details in social space. What about Tiso, Tuka, Mach? Well, they're absolutely gone from public space. And maybe the most powerful example, let's go back for a moment to Bitcha. We were already there. I showed you the building where Tiso was born, where there is a plaque to him. Yes, but while walking on the way, a hundred meters before his house, there's a plaque with plenty of flowers. And that's to the uprising, which may be the best example of the moral choice that in the end most of the Slovak took against fascism. So the last accord is legal after the war. For example, Tiso and Tuka were condemned to death and hanged and hundreds and thousands of uh, party and Hlinka guard people for years in prison. Let me take you now for a second to a small town called Vrutki next to Martin from episode 2. This is uh, till the very day actually a train hub. So when the uprising began it was very important to take it and it wasn't only the Slovaks fighting here, you are going to see a plaque to some French um, soldiers. So there was fierce fighting here, hence one of the places that did get burned down, uh, a village next to the place. Of course many people were also killed, so there is a very big um, cemetery and plenty of recognition to the uprising. So this is a great place to show you how things used to work after 45, because of course it's not simply Czechoslovakia, it's the communist Czechoslovakia. The uprising was filled with the people with different ideologies, but because communists won after the war, it was them who had the time to put monuments, and most of them will not have anybody else but communists, and actually as absurd as it may sound, there were people who were part of the uprising, they did not agree with communism, they ended up in prison very often in the same cell with the Hlinka guards they were fighting against during the uprising. Unfortunately, that will happen as well. And here is a perfect example, social uh, realism showing you who was in charge of the monuments commemorating the uprising. And here a very good symbol of Czechoslovakia, the Bohemian Lion with a Slovak coat of arms. And it is actually a very interesting thing, and from a point of view of a Pole, also slightly distressing. In Poland, we do not consider today Soviet Union a liberator exactly, as, well, first of all, Stalin invaded Poland with Hitler in 39. There was something called Warsaw Uprising. Soviet Union did not help, waiting for the uprising to bleed out, as it was Polish anti-Soviet, we could say. And in Slovakia you will find plenty, plenty of monuments still bearing all the Soviet regalia, so to speak. Now here is their point of view. They did consider Soviet Union a liberator and Soviet Union did consider the uprising important because it was a leftist, mostly, uprising communist being involved. And today you will find monuments commemorating victims of communism as well, but there are still also plenty, plenty of good old school 60s, 70s monuments uh, around. And for me, always a bit of a shock really, but this is why context sometimes is extremely important. Now we're out of the museum. We're gonna walk a bit around the park that's on the back with some tanks and armored vehicles and whatnot. And a couple of words about what we just saw there, see the thing is, the um, exhibition is completely fine, especially the first part is very modern, uh, 21st century style, so kind of interactive and things happening and so on, pretty cool. Then less interactive, but no less cool, plenty of info, plenty of things to see, good. There's only one little issue, I dare say, and I don't want to offend anybody here, 
but people who prepared the exhibition are leaning towards the left. Now, why do I say that? Soviet Union doesn't exist as the bad guy here. Uh, two examples. At the beginning, there's this interactive map uh, about states which before Second World War became uh, Nazi or fascist uh, or authoritarian. And Soviet Union isn't there. So I do understand that Soviet Union is not a Nazi or a fascist state, but authoritarian. Stalin doesn't come up as an authoritarian ruler. That's funny. Soviet Union, according to that map, was perfectly fine and democratic and beautiful, which is uh, not true, to say the least. And then there's a, as a set of uh, countries that get invaded at the beginning of war and how it happens and when. And Soviet Union isn't there either. So the Pact Ribbentrop-Molotov never happened, obviously. Soviet Union did not invade Poland in 39 together with Hitler. They did not invade Finland. They did not invade the Baltic states. They didn't force Romania to give up Bessarabia. None of that happened, obviously, according to the museum. Soviet Union suddenly got attacked by Hitler out of nowhere, out of nothing. Nobody expected the Spanish Inquisition, do you know what I mean? So, two, he, well, two examples of one huge issue that this museum has. Completely, uh, so to speak, widening the history of uh, Soviet Union. So, don't get me wrong, the museum is definitely interesting. Come, visit, if you're here, good. But keep in mind the, um, that even good museums may have issues and biases. So let's have an extra mural or two. And we finished a difficult but a very important topic. So I guess we deserve a very good craft beer. But next episode will be going back to the good old Middle Ages. So prepare to get castleized. See you soon.